But my mic? Oh, yeah. But these poor people want to hear me. Thank you. <laughs> oh, yeah. I think we're giving it five more minutes, four more minutes. You guys can hang in. I think we'll get started. This is a lot of sound for five, six people, <laughs> but it's good. I'm Jack Recuto. Welcome. Um, the topic that, uh, for this hour is uh, smart squared, and it's around collaborative creativity or collaborative innovation. Um, let me go around real quick. Introduce. Sure. I'm Dennis. Where are you from? What, what do you want to know about? Yeah, that? where are you from? What do you do? I'm from the Cleveland area. I'm a network engineer, primarily. Okay, excellent. Okay. You're I'm Michael. Okay, we got a guy behind. Go ahead. Okay, great. <coughs> yeah, yeah, now you. I'm Michael, I'm a uh, assistant admin in Finley. Okay. Chad, IT monkey kind of thing. IT monkey kind of thing, that's good. Just put that on the card, that's all. <laughs> all right. I should. Yeah, you should, yeah. <laughs> it, it grabs attention, that's the whole thing, right? Kind of thing, or <laughs> <laughs> he's got kind of thing in his title. <laughs> yeah, yeah, good, good, okay, excellent. Um, I do a lot. A lot of my work, uh, a good part of my work, is facilitation. I work with corporations and communities, and in most cases, we're trying to make change occur. And so, change, innovation, creativity is all at the core of my business, and it's all collaborative. I'm never working with, an in, with one innovator who's locked in a room trying to create an innovation. It's always a group, a team. It could be four people. It could be 400 people. It could be 10,000 people. Um, and so that's kind of at the core of my work. I work, I work out of Cleveland here, live and work in the uh, downtown Cleveland area, one of the uh, <coughs> neighborhoods here uh, called Tremont that I live in. And uh, here's the famous Valdis Krebs. He's speaking tonight. You're going to have to make sure you're here for this. 7 o'clock, right? Yeah. Okay. Vaud's the colleague and friend. Um, and he's going to be talking about social network. I'm going to touch on it. Just we went to, to the same tailor today. Yeah, we did. Well, you did email me and say we're, we're black and brown. So I, I followed directions. Um, I will talk a little bit about social network stuff. Uh, because, uh, just to tease you a little bit, to uh, segue into Valdis' talk uh, this evening. What I want to talk about, um, are we good? Yeah. Okay. You're forward, so we have to have the speaker. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm forward, mean personality-wise? Okay. okay. A little both. A little both, okay. I'm not going to stand back there, because I'm not doing any stinking PowerPoints. All right. Everybody else can do that. It's all about this eyeball. Um, uh, so what I want to talk about this afternoon, here's the, the kind of the lineup. I want to address questions like, uh, what are the advantages of collaboration when we're trying to create an innovation? What are some of the obstacles? Uh, what are some best practices, how-tos? I also want to address a few uh, examples you know, that you may or may not relate to that, that have to do with collaboration in, in the innovation area. Uh, a lot of what I'm going to talk about uh, started in, actually, 10 years ago uh, when I did this book called Collaborative Creativity. And 
Um, I still have a bunch, so if you send me your email, I will send you one for free. And if you ask for three, I'll send you three for free. No, I'm just that lucky. <laughs> I'm trying to get rid of them because I have to do a different edition. I have to update the edition, so these I got a phase. That's like a clearance sale, <laughs> except for free. Oh yeah, well you can get this now on the Amazon for like two thirty-five or something. So save your save your money, and shipping is ten dollars, but that's okay. <laughs> um, and then I want to address your questions. If you have any questions or comments or, or, uh, or uh, arguments, um, uh, dissension. Dissension is good in innovation. Right? So anything I say is wrong, I want you to pick it up and you know, let me know what's right. Um, I guess as far as, as uh, the whole why around uh, collaboration, why, why does it take more than one mind? And I want to do it historically. <coughs> Afternoon. These are, this is Gloria and Tim Ferriss who just joined us. They are at the top of the blogging community in Northeast Ohio. We got a blog from like the leather show over at the window. <laughs> <laughs> They're an old hippie couple, but we don't want to talk about that. Tim is actually not at the top of the blog sphere. He's He's scraping the bottom, but Gloria is at the top. But yeah, <laughs> I had to say that because he he demands teasing. Is this the humiliation class you dropped? Yeah, yeah, it is. It's one of those. Yeah, it's a self-esteem seminar. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I'm a dynamic speaker, and I'm going to make you feel bad. Uh, <laughs> I'm glad this is taped. Oh God. Um, so the. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And, and it'll be forever. And my clients will say, "We saw this video." Um, were you high? Yeah, were you? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, uh, no green tea. Green tea, man. It's all green tea. Um, the why? Here's what happens. Um, why do people like the, you know all the the the, the uh, uh, the generation of, of innovators, the Disneys, the Edisons, right? Uh, all the people at Apple. Um, you think of, of, about all the, the, the rock star innovators. And, and Time Magazine and all the magazines feature the picture of the hero. And it's always a lie. Because these people uh, might have been the, the, um, the prime movers, but it was teams that always made things happen, right? It was studios of people. It was buildings full of people. I mean, even Microsoft, you know, pulling together, you know, lots of different, you know, um, um, uh, of things that were innovations from teams, right? Apple, outsourcing, uh, doing a lot of open source uh, uh, development, obviously team oriented. And the reason why the collaboration is so important, and why working alone doesn't work. It's because we fall in love with our own ideas. We breathe our own air. And it's a pot, and it's, it, 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 if one of my uh, uh, client companies called me today and said, you know, how can I stop innovation in this company, right? Whether it's a company of two people or, or, or 2,000 people, I'd say just tell everybody they've got to have new ideas on their own, by themselves. Don't talk to anybody else. Don't stand at the water cooler. You know, don't share your ideas with anybody. And that'll kill ideas, right? That's, that's the surest way. Because what happens, what, what creativity demands is, is really diversity and a lot of stimulus between different minds. So the idea that we're smarter together is smart squared, right? The idea that we're smarter together is, is a quantum reality. It's absolutely, absolutely true. Um, some of the obstacles, why don't we do this? Um, for some of us, we just lack experience. We just have not done enough collaboration. We're having an idea. We haven't brought enough people to the table. And the more you do that, the better you get at it, which is, and, and the more you see the value of it. Uh, putting this conference together, right? Was it one person locking themselves in the bathroom? Well, actually it was. 
but uh, we had an example. No, it wasn't, right? It's lots of ideas and teams of people. Um, another another uh, um, uh, barrier to collaborative innovation is the whole idea of, uh, uh, of not understanding the creative process. When I did this book, Collaborative Creativity, uh, 10 years ago, I had the chance to um, interview the top artists and inventors in the world. Okay, so these are people who, who did small little things like invent the electron microscope, uh, the MRI, first MRI, um, breakthrough medications, um, the guy who invented the pacemaker, right? Top artists in every craft possible, painting, glass, right? Metals, uh, sculpture, ceramics, and so on. And these are the world-class people, the top of the top of the top. And one of the things they all said was that, you know, one of the principles in creativity is quantity leads to quality. That more ideas literally lead to better ideas. So when I do idea sessions with companies, right, uh, like a buddy of mine, Doug Hall, who's, who's a rock star in Cincinnati, works with uh, you know, Nike and Celestial Seasonings and P&G and all these places, and does all their creative work around new product development. When I, when I do new product development or new program development, you know, we're always looking for lots of ideas. What he does, which is kind of cool, is he'll get the top minds together from, let's say, uh, Nike, and he'll get them in a room and he'll say, okay, give me your best ideas on this new product. And he'll collect them all, 40 or 50 ideas. And he'll turn around, he's got a beautiful fireplace in, in the space that he uses down in Cincinnati. And uh, he'll put them together and he'll say, these are great ideas. And he'll turn around and he'll fling them into a uh, fireplace. And people are just horrified, right? Because they don't understand the creative process that your first generation of ideas are, are almost always your worst. And to marry any one of them is like the, the most ridiculous thing. It's it just, it just part of our ignorance of the creative process. We think that, oh, I've got to really work hard for this, like, this brilliant idea. I've had a couple bad ones so far. Well, you may be like 283, you know, those of us who have done this work for many years, you, you might be 190 ideas away from a good idea. You know, and there's no, there's, there's no way to get from here to there easily. Right? You just have to go through iteration after iteration. Now what happens is, if you invite other minds into the process that are diverse, you accelerate the process. Instead of you having one idea after another, think about the time that happens. Right? So when I work with, if I have 10 people and I have everybody generating idea after I, idea after about four or five hours, we'll have two or three hundred ideas and we'll have guaranteed 10 to 12 breakthrough ideas. Okay? So, you know, so obviously, you know, rule number one, if I'm going to sit there and do it all my, by myself, A, I'm slowing down the process, and B, I may never get there. Because I'm breathing my own air. I'm drinking my own Kool-Aid. Right? I love my ideas. No one is smarter than Jack. Okay? According to me. Yeah? yeah for a while there, Mm -hmm. You know, they came out and created this whole new world. And where are they today? Right. Part of AOL. Right, right. <laughs> How embarrassing is that? <laughs> yeah, where's AOL? Yeah, where's AOL? Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so it is. So it is. It's, it's like, you know, it's, it's, that's exactly right. You, you, you know, and same, same with the iPod. Mm -hmm. It wasn't the first MP3 player out there. It was probably the 20th. Right, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so, so the idea of, of, of having kind of this Zen uh, attitude of not being attached, non-attachment to our first ideas, right? Non-attachment to our own ideas is, is really at the core of inviting other people into the process. Okay. Um, now, as far as, as, so how does this happen? How does it work? Uh, one of the, about uh, four years ago, um, I did a book called, uh, uh, morning. 
afternoon, whatever time zone you're in. Um, I did a book called Accidental Conversations. And the whole theme around that, I did a lot of research around innovation. And one of the themes in Accidental Conversations is the idea that the best things in life happen unplanned. Okay. That you could sit and, and, and try to engineer good ideas or solutions to problems. You know, you're trying to work it out again in a very linear, logical way. And usually, you know, the aha is going to be a surprise. So think, think about, um, think about the, the paradox or oxymoron around, you know, we want, to, we want to invent or we want to engineer the development of a surprise. Okay. So I came up with the idea of, of uh, strategic serendipity. And strategic serendipity is when I know what I want to create, I know what the problem I want to solve, and I put my, myself in spaces where, uh, where surprise can occur. And so that's the power of the, the water cooler, the coffee shop. Right This morning at, at, at 7.30, I jump, bump into <coughs> Jim and, and, um, uh, at a coffee shop. And, uh, yeah, and, and the bouncer, the young lady was the bouncer in the back. Yeah. And you know, if it was a normal morning where I wasn't running uh, uh, to, to work and he wasn't you know, running to a major conference, um, we might have hung out, we might have talked, we might have chatted. Where would that conversation go? You have no idea where it ends up. Okay. And, and, and if we want to even make it even more statistically or quant uh, from a quantum point of view, uh, more possible that we end up with new ideas, right? We, Glory and Tim, who, who also are, are uh, kind of regulars at this place, Civilization and Tremont, um, we, they get, we get them in the conversation. Right? Now, uh, the, 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 uh, the stakes, not the stakes, but the potential benefits are even higher if they're clueless to the content of the conversation, right? If they're clueless to the content of the conversation, which means that they don't have, they don't have any knowledge to add. What they have to add are naive questions, okay? Uh, Tim is great at that. He'll just come out of the blue. You don't know where he's coming from. I don't know what he, what he, where, you don't know where his head is ever. And he'll come out and say, okay, what about this? And that's going to, that's going to throw a curve into the conversation. And if anybody actually bothers to listen to him and take him seriously, right, it can take us down a road that's unplanned. And the unplanned road actually has more possibility than all the logical, you know, maneuverings and all the effort we're trying to get at a logical solution. That's what it is. I go in on a financial planning basis and I ask people, what if? Yeah. Right. And that's essentially where some of my mindset comes from. The other one is I just like to disrupt things. Yeah. <laughs> Provoke, piss off, and disrupt. Yeah. It's on his card. <laughs> kind of thing. Not necessarily in that order. No, no, no. <laughs> not at all. Is that middle one? Provoke, what, and disrupt? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Annoy. Annoy. Oh, okay. Thank yeah. You. Uh, so, so I really want, so if you want to, uh, <laughs> Uh, you want to think about who to, the question becomes, well, who should I invite into my thought process? And what I'm saying is that the most unlikely candidates are potentially uh, the most powerful. Okay. A little segue now into social network stuff. Um, uh, I, I started learning uh, kind of um, uh, as a student of social network uh, development, social network theory from, with Valdis a few years ago. And um, he's really mentored me in, in a lot of this stuff. And one of the things that, that, uh, that I've, I've learned and certainly practice is the idea of um, uh, uh, the, the social networks that we're involved with. The way that I visualize it is basically that we all are, live in three circles. Right? There's a first circle, second, and third circle. Our first circle are the people we know, we know the best. And, and as Valdis often says, they're the ones who probably have the same ideas you do because you're hanging out, right? You're talking, and you're constantly updating. You're reading the same stuff. You're reading the same blogs. You, you know, you're writing the same blogs. You know, you're going to the same events. You're breathing the same air. That's your first circle. The second circle are the people they know, right? Okay. So I know Gloria, but I don't know. I, and I know somebody through her, right? But I, I know of them, but I don't, really don't know them. 
Okay. My third circle are the people they know. Right? So if I didn't know Valdis, and Gloria did, Gloria knows Valdis, right? I know of him, right? He knows somebody else. It's that third circle where the gold lives. Those are the people who are interacting with things right, that I have, I have the least interaction with. Or if I want new ideas, I'm going to go out to that. If I'm the core, because I am the center of my universe, right? if I'm the core of my network, I have to go out to get new ideas. Right? And so it's, it, it, it's, uh, it, this is a real practical matter. Right? It's, if you're at a party and you want new ideas, or you're networking, you're solving a problem, I'm going to call a friend of mine. You should do that. You should say, do you have any ideas? Okay? But, you know, don't spend too much time with that because they may or may not. Um, if you ask them, who do you know? Who do you go to for ideas? And who do they go to? And they name names and you say, I don't even know who that is. That's who you should be on the phone with, right? That's who you should be instant messaging or emailing, right? Taking for a beer or coffee. Because that's the person who's going to have the freshest ideas, the freshest questions. Have you thought about this? That's why a lot of us like to travel. We go to places, we meet people we don't know, we get ideas, we bring them back. Uh, Cleveland is a really rich ecology right now of thought, uh, of thought people. We have, uh, we have a lot of people here in Cleveland who travel out, and we're the out-of-town experts. Right? And we live here. We come back here. And we feed each other all the time. So there's, there's, a, there's a corollary to this rule about people closest to you. Because if, if people in your first circle are people who are out interacting with new people a lot, then your first circle is really valuable to you. Right? And I'm very fortunate that way. I have a lot of people in my first circle who I can call. Baldus is my first circle. I can call him. I, I, I don't know what he's going to say. Right? So if you have people in your life who are unpredictable you know, but known to you, you know, that's really valuable in terms of, of innovation. Um, making sure our time is good. I want to talk a little bit about um, uh, uh, the, the idea that, that uh, collaboration has to happen throughout the whole, uh, the whole process, around the whole innovation process. In the beginning of ideas, the point I'm making is this. Let me get to my point, and then I'll, I'll back into it. The point I'm making is this, is that if you want to involve a team of people, the more diverse the personalities, the better. Right? If, you, if you want a very limited amount of new ideas, invite people who are the same. Okay? Same height, same weight, same color, same shape, same background, same, you know, uh, discipline, same, they all went to the same schools, and so on. The key is, is differences, including personality differences. Okay, so I just want to name some and talk about where, the, where, where, where to engage them. Because if you just say, I want to engage people randomly, <coughs> you are following the accidental conversation rule, and you get some new ideas, but innovation is this movement from creativity to a final deliverable. So let's talk about the different personalities. In the beginning uh, of, a, of the creative process or any innovation, you're looking for a solution, you're looking for a new idea, you want people who are dreamers. You want people who are opposers. People who say, you know what? I think the normal way things happen stinks, right? I don't like the norm. They're, they're, your, they're, they're the people who push back, right? You know, whatever the norm is, if everybody's 4X, they're against it. They're, they're skeptical of it. They're cynical. You know people like that. Those are great people to have in the beginning of the process. After that, but this is important, they may not have value to you after that. Okay? All right? Because they have like one speed. Push back, right? Think different. And, and that's their job. And the whole idea behind the personality differences is that everybody's got their job at the right time. Okay? So if you know somebody who's really good at analyzing risks and looking at risk, you don't want them having the beginning of the thing, right? Okay? They come in later. I'll talk about them in a minute. The whiny, the paranoid, and the, the afraid. Okay? And, and they have a place in the process, but not in the beginning. So you don't call, if you're, 
if you really want to orchestrate the process well, you don't call them in the beginning. You don't even have them at the table. Okay? They want to come and say, you know, we need you at the right time. It's just like if you're building a house. You don't want the drywall guys showing up at, right when you're taking the hall. Right? You guys are nice, drywall's nice, everything's beautiful, right? You know, here, here's ten bucks, have a beer, you know, come back in three weeks. Because we need you then. Okay. All the uh, all the, the big uh, creative firms like IDEO um, are, are genius at this. They know who to bring in at the right time in order to move the process along. Um, once you get your ideas going, you have a lot of ideas, um, you have to make sure they work. So you need people in the process early on, but not too early, who start to, who understand the market, right? Who are, you, who are you aiming for? What are you building this for? And they may not be your idea people. The market people are the people who, who, who love research. They're people who love to talk to other people. What are you looking for right, in this design, in this product, in this service, uh, in this solution? People who love talking to the end users. They may not help you technically, but they're the people who have their ear to the ground. They're the ones who say, this is what is going to sell. And, and you cannot pay them enough money for that. Um, now you're into the, in the building of whatever is new, right? The innovation. Now in this conference, new, new technology, new tool, new software, new solution. And, and you've got people who are just good at locking themselves in a room and, and solving problems that way. Right? They're good problem solvers. The, the, um, the whiny and the paranoid they come in when you're doing risk management, right? How could this go wrong, right? But again, you only want them in the, in the conversation for about 15 minutes, unless they're very creative people. Creative people you need throughout. The other kind of people you need throughout the process are people who are experienced. They've been there and they've done that. Okay, and that's why the dot coms turned into dot bombs early on. Because I was involved with some of them back in the late 90s. Uh, here in the Cleveland area. Now we blew, th we, in the one, we blew through $20 million in six months. You're right, and, and all we had at the end was the owner being arrested in Taiwan and in prison. I mean, that was the deliverable, okay? <laughs> it, it wasn't that satisfying, okay? And it wasn't in our business plan, you know, which we had in t t $20 million worth of investors. That wasn't what they were exactly looking for. It was entertaining, but not useful. <laughs> it was, it was. But in, but in that case, I mean, we had, um, uh, we had a lot of 20-somethings and 30-somethings. We had no 40 and 50-somethings. <clears throat> and then that kind of flipped where um, a few years later, you, you would start to see it flip, where, they tr where a lot of companies or startups try to do uh, startups with 40 and 50 something saying, well, we need the maturity here. Those things die too, right? Because you can't do it. These people are all thinking like 40 and 50 something people, right? And you need that, you need that cross generational uh, synergy, right? That kind of collaboration to make it happen. So now, story after story after story, all right? Read the paper, read the magazine, listen to the stories, go to conferences, and people are winning. Okay. Why is it coming back? Why is it working today? It's working today because in every case, and you'll see the pictures of who's on the teams, and these are very multi-generational teams. And they're much more cross-disciplinary, right? They're not just marketing people. They're not just tech people, right? Um, it's, not, it's not a geeked out community anymore. It's a much more rich, diverse. And the reason why is because we all learned. You know, we're not stupid. We woke up and said, okay, that didn't work. Why didn't it work? because we didn't get the collaboration right. Collaboration was there, and the resources were there. I mean, $20 million is, I think that's enough for a startup, you know? It was a, and it was a web, it was a, it was a, um, the product was a, uh, as a commerce, um, kind of educational slash commerce website. How bad can that be? Okay. It was a great concept, but we just didn't have the right mix of people. They also didn't know who, who to bring in at the right time. Um, some examples of, um, 
uh, of, of collaborations. Uh, Valdis and I have a, a good friend of ours, June Holly, who um, uh, along with a few other people in Athens, Ohio, over a 20-year period, totally turned around a, a completely impoverished uh, uh, economic area. This is in southern Appalachian, Ohio. Turn that around just through the innovation of small businesses, all through, through new collaborations. A farmer hooking up with a web developer, hooking up with a marketing person, graphics person, um, uh, hooking up with a grant writer or business plan you know, a guru, and they were able to, to uh, tweak these businesses and, and, uh, and make them happen. Uh, now, what is it, a couple hundred, right? Actually, several hundred new businesses have popped up and transformed this area in the last 20 years, all through collaboration. But again, through this multidisciplinary. And, this they, is, keep, and they keep recombining. Yeah, and, and you know, it's, it's just amazing. Like, someone's working here, then they're working there, then the, the stories keep exchanging, and mm -hmm. information keeps flowing around. And it's just an amazing place. It's, it's, it's just like a hotbed. They can't, it's like they cannot fail. Now they've, and they've had actually very little failure, um, but I think that's because they did the collaboration so right. And that was June's genius, was to know exactly who the right people to write time were. Um, Toyota, it's interesting now, you talk about collaboration. Toyota, places like Toyota and, uh, and GE are outsourcing their R&D, in, in, right? Into networked R&D, and they're not even shops anymore, but they're shops in the sense that you have you have one guy in Taiwan and a, and a guy in Seattle and a guy in Finland or a guy in Latvia, right, all collaborating uh, around new product development for Toyota or GE. And, and that's, that's the new model now. It's getting away from them doing things inside their own controlled environment to a much more uh, almost open source in terms of how the functionality goes. Not, the, not necessarily the, legal, the legalities of it, but definitely the... Uh, the way, it, the way it occurs. A friend of mine, Charlie Wilkes, uh, a few years ago, uh, down in Akron, uh, was the first person to really uh, uh, go around to the universities and um, say, you know, you guys really need to be buddying up with uh, uh, companies trying to do polymer products. So he hooked up the researchers uh, in labs with the academicians and the, and the researchers in the universities and um, uh, formed a, a collaborative of about 40 or 50 people in different entities and they came up with 12 brand new patents for polymer applications. And, you know, here polymer, uh, Akron's like the polymer capital of the world, so we had a lot of that here. But he tells the story in a very nonchalant way of, you know, we just pulled these people together and they made magic happen. So a lot of it is, 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 is these kind of crossing, blurring, and obliterating boundaries that we end up with the collaborations. Um, when, again, when I did the research for collaborative creativity 10 years ago, uh, almost all the artists and inventors that I talked to uh, said that they create best in collaboration with other people. And the, I mean, if you look back in the arts, you know, the Picassos and the Matisses were all collaborators. All collaborators. They all had their friends they hung out with. Uh, they, they, they worked out their, out their ideas. Again, unfortunately, the media, which, you know, which, which represents kind of our patriarchal view of our culture, always only has the one guy on the front cover of the magazine, right? You know, this is, or one person has to sign it. A lot of these guys said, if I was honest, I would have our whole team sign paintings or sign sculptures, right? But the you know, we're told that, no, no, one, one name has to go on it, because people can't relate to, our culture can't relate to a team, right, of signatures. We, we want to know who the hero was, because we think it's, it's cooler. Well, it is cooler, but it's inaccurate. Yeah, that, oh, that's, well, when I went to school, um, we were taught actually how not to collaborate. Right. Um, the only time we collaborated, uh, the only time we collaborated in school 
uh, we were called to the office for. <laughs> and they called it cheating. And for us, it was collaboration. You know, it was like, well, what'd you get on this one? You know? Well, and, and I think that has to change. I mean, I, the part I'm doing for it is I still teach uh, uh, at the uh, Executive MBA uh, program at Kent State. And um, I have no business teaching there because I don't have an MBA that I always tell my students. But that's what I like about it is I'm helping them get their little MBAs. And um, uh, the, class, the classes that I teach, um, I have a cheating rule, which is part of the points you're going to get for this class is cheating. Right? If you want to work in the corporate world, you're going to have to be able to trade and exchange right, resources and, and create things together. Okay? It, it's really, it, and it is a function of scale and speed. Right? That when we're, when we're working together, we can get to scale and, we get to, and, and speed occurs too. Right? Because of the synergy. If you look at Wiki, the other talk we're going on right now that I wish I was at, except I'm really liking being here, but if I wasn't here is what I'm saying. Um, I'd be at the wiki thing. Isn't that now, Jim? Isn't the wiki? Uh, yep. Yeah. Right next door. Yeah, right next door. Um, what a great thing, right? Uh, the, um, the Virginia Tech, you know, they had like 120,000 uh, posts in the first, you know, what is it, a few hours or a couple days. Uh, lots of accuracy. Uh, Wikipedia has, right, talk about collaborative effort. Uh, according to New York Times, has virtually the same accuracy. And of course, more speed than Britannica. Than Britannica. So for, I know he's talking a lot about the faults and failures, both from a technical and a content point of view. But the fact of the matter is, when, when the, ex, ex, when the uh, experts have looked at it next to Britannica, they're saying, you can go with Wikipedia. Okay? It's very faithful and trustworthy. But I think that goes to Gloria's point. You can't use Wikipedia because we have this whole kind of fundamental bias that how could anything that's open source, right, be good? You know, I mean, if you, you know, like when, when I went to school, if I raised my hand, we didn't have open source as a concept then, but if I said, you know what, Ten Commandments, open source those puppies, okay? I would have been smacked, right? right? Math, let's open source that. Let's decide together, right? what the rules should be, you know? Why not? But that's what's transforming the world, are the innovations and the changes happening through collaboration. In this town, everything good we see, everything new, right, has happened through collaboration. You look at the transformation of neighborhoods like Ohio City and Tremont, you see the transformation in, public, in the, in the uh, publication, the media industry, through the blog sphere, you know, where, the, where the, uh, the mainstream media now takes a lot of its, its cues from. Right. Tremendous amount of collaboration going on there. If you look at the arts, right, the presence of uh, all the galleries in Tremont, uh, Murray Hill, right, different parts of the city, all the new stuff happening. One Cleveland, which is called something else. What is it now? One Community. One Community, yeah. I mean, all these things are happening. One Community Plus. Plus. <laughs> I, uh, you know what? Uh, I think I think that's. I'll take it personally. I'm not. I'm not that plus. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Forty Four W. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, they're yeah, right. Right. Cheating. No. Cheating. There's a friend of ours, Bob McDonald, who's recently retired from a thing called Life USA. Okay. He wrote a book called Cheat to Win. C T W. Okay. And his whole premise in the whole book is you have to break the rules for any of us to go forward. Right, exactly. Plus. 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 Thanks. Plus. Yeah, you keep, well, it, keep on think that. Think about, you know, go, go back to high school and think about all the kids you went to high school with. And think about all the smartest kids. And where are they today? They're working for somebody. Yeah, they're working for somebody. They're not in the newspapers. You know, I, I got together with a couple old pals of mine from Euclid High School. And we're thinking, you know, who are the people that have made it to a newspaper, to a magazine, things like that? And 
they were all the B and C. They weren't the A and C. Right. You know, I'm thinking, you know, I took, um, I took advanced placement classes. None of the people that I went to class with have I ever seen in any publication anywhere. And I'm old, and I'm widely read. Well, I know you. Well, I think twenty seven pluses. But but you know, yeah. he was I mean, but but th there was that same type of thing, you know, there were people that that were good at something and they really didn't care about the system. Or or they did just enough to get through the system and then they went out and did their own thing. Right, because they realized that the system wasn't gonna work for them. Right. I mean, I think that, that and some kids in creative that are creative in high school find that out very early. Now the top, the top one percent, like the artists and inventors who I interviewed for the book, um, you know, the top one percent of the smart group, okay, they really get it. Uh, and and I'll just uh, finish up with an anecdote from that. I was in New York um, a couple weeks ago, and I, uh, I I was at a conference, and I happened to be on, uh, standing on the sidewalk waiting for a, a cab with a guy, and I got in the conversation, find out that that uh, he's the mentor of uh, the young guy who just won the Nobel Prize in uh, biochemistry. And um, I'm talking to him about research and what's happening today, and it's all collaboration. He said, we cannot collaborate enough or fast enough with people outside of our area. You know, so other, like pharmaceutical companies, other researchers, you know, sharing of information is really, really hot. And, 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 that, and they know that. They know that we're smarter together, and, it's and they know they have to get to market fast, because they're all doing basic science to you know, get rid of hep C, which is, uh, uh, affects billions of people on the planet, and they know they need to get there as quickly as possible. They will never take the approach that we're smarter than anybody, we have to get there alone. So um, uh, let me, I, I want to end on that note and keep our, honor our time, because we're, we're keeping the, the meatball rolling here. And, Thank you so much for inviting me into uh, the talk here, and thanks for the dialogue. Thank you.